Our next speaker is one of the most both technically and creatively savvy people I know. So if there's ever an obstacle I have, I always send Dave a message and he has a creative solution. He finds a way to make it look good and he can teach you how to do it too. So he's a triple threat. So Dave Stan, go ahead and kind of come up here. He's the, a former technology fellow here at the Pointer Institute. He also is a former professor at the University of Florida. And he is now the managing director at Smart Media Creative and the creator and um, managing director of Splashbox Sports. Correct. So um, Dave, the future of journalism is? Well, since some really good C words got used up in the last session, uh, I'll go with context. He had me okay. nervous for a second. <laughs> I, I got nothing. I got nothing. He, he solved it already. No, I say context because you know we've really shifted from, as as the last presenter talked about, the mass media model of a single message coming down through you know limited channels to the to the masses. So here's what you've got to consume, and now it's so fractured, and everybody kind of building their own media channels, and so the. The media channel that makes sense for you depends on your place in life, uh, your friends, your family, maybe it might be a, a medical, a medical uh, ailment that you have, or um, you know, just where you're at temporarily, like today. The context for everybody today has changed very drastically from what your daily life is. Well, that is one long sentence, and I will let you continue that sentence with your presentation. All right. Thanks, Dave. Do I have to flip it over? Wait for it. This is my favorite lines from Psych. Anybody watch Psych? <laughs> Wait for it. Sorry, I've, I do not have a lot of musical ability, so I can't, so I can't entertain you with that. OK, so my talk is about context and building community through live streaming video. So, if we're talking about the future of journalism, I think you have to talk about the past and the present of journalism. So when we look at the past of journalism, the way we do journalism, the way we consume journalism is really a byproduct of a lot of tradition and a lot of restrictions in the channels. So the story forms we tend to see, inverted pyramid style, comes from wire services. There's specific restrictions over wire services we want to lead with specific information first in case the wire service happens to get cut off. And then where that comes into is that it would come and funnel into a place that, um, you know, the wire desk, and this guy, David Manning White, who probably nobody in this room has ever heard of unless you uh, have a graduate degree in mass comm or social media. Well, definitely not social media, social science. So the, the, what he coined was this term called Mr. Gates to represent the gatekeeper. He tried to personify this guy or group of people that would be at a news organization and would get these dispatches coming through the wire, would try to assign relevance and importance to these or news values. And typically, there, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different news values, but it really comes down to proximity, prominence, and conflict. Those are the ones that kind of drive most news historically. So mass media would be, let's try to find out the stories that either have something, somebody that's really prominent somebody who we can understand the proximity that this, is, this relates to a specific market, a very large market in New York or Los Angeles, someplace else. That's the type of content that's gonna get, driven, that's gonna get a lot of exposure. And things that are conflict, things that have obvious sides. Now in the present, what it, what it switches to is we're doing the same kind of thing, the same type of reporting, we're creating the same types of stories, essentially narratives. You know, we are doing some alternative story forms, but it's, it's a lot of the same, and we now have many, many more channels to get it through. So we have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have LinkedIn, we have Tumblr, we have people at home on their webcams doing whatever they want to do on their webcams. So we have all these channels, but most of the stories are still being told in the same way. We have newspaper-style articles on the web. We have TV-style video segments on the web. But we don't have a lot of content that's created specifically for this really fractured platform that we call the internet and the web. Where do I point this? Arrows or a different button? Okay, so when I think about the future of journalism, this is, this, is the, this is the place where I think the future in journalism starts, at least for me. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it together in one guy. 
So this, this particular face might be familiar to some people in this room. So just quick show of hands, who just from this picture knows who this is? Okay, that's, that's a pretty bold statement that you just know from the face of a journalist slash programmer who he is. Okay, so why is Adrian Halavati important? So Adrian Halavati lives in Chicago and you know, known for many things, and probably the most well-known, actually most useful, is writing a web development framework called Django that facilitates all this awesome stuff that happens in news organizations now. But the reason this guy is so important, I don't think, is because of Django or because of any specific technology. It's more of a philosophy that, that he has and that he advocates. So what Adrian is really big on, and I'll put some, I'm put some words into his mouth a little bit, but instead of trying to think of, well, here's the format that news is gonna take, and we're gonna create this content, but the end result is gonna be a newspaper article or a TV or you know, a broadcast video segment, and we may see that in a lot of different places. For him, the end goal is not necessarily a traditional story form. It may be some specific type of database or data structure or something that conveys a message or provides some utility, but it's not that he's creating or advocating creating an infographic with data behind it that uh, illustrates a narrative. And that's the real thing, is that he's not, he's not trying to create things that illustrate a narrative. The data itself is the end point. Okay, so he gets a big check mark in my book. Very, very important guy. He started out where he kind of got his, his claim to fame was this thing, chicagocrime.org, which unfortunately, I, I wish this was preserved a little bit better, someplace where you could get and see a lot of it. So what chicagocrime.org uh, did is it tried to grab all this content from police blotters, and here's crime that's happening around you. So this is where that proximity really comes into play. A crime that happens down the street is much more important to your context than a crime that happens in a different state. You're not worried about somebody mugging you in Missouri if you live in Indiana. But as he's going through this and, and, and working on this project, he evolves it into every block. So every block, probably everybody in this room has peeked at every block at some time. And well, what's different between every block and Chicago crime? there's all of these different types of information on top of it. It's not the traditional news types of you know, crime, conflict, but there's things that are just important to you if you live in this neighborhood. Real estate listings, lost and found postings. The real, the real thing here is that um, he's trying to make news as what's relevant to you based on your space. And taking away from the maps, now there's more, a little bit more of an article-based approach where, it's, where they're trying to do classroom fundraisers. So this is not something that we would consider typical news. And a classroom fundraiser, if you're gonna get that in a local newspaper, it would have to be something that is pretty bold. It would have to have an amazing visual to go along with it to get the staff photographer to come out and do it. But if you live, if you're a person who, who goes to the school or your kids go to the school, this is tremendously important to you. And so this is the stuff that gets me the most excited. And in the mission statement of when they did some redesign on every block, our goal is to make your block a better place. So to me, this is, mean, this is kind of a different change of philosophy that news is not something that's coming from us as gatekeepers, as decision makers, to tell you what is important. It is your ability as a consumer, as an individual, as a person, to know what is important and to have access to the information you can go find and assemble so you can make decisions and you can be a better person in your different contexts. Here's another really important person that, and especially in, in, in St. Pete, a lot of people probably know this guy. So Matt Waite used to be at the St. Pete Times and developed a project called PolitiFact. So now PolitiFact's also very interesting, not because it won a Pulitzer, which is awesome, but it's because this still the destination for this project is the fact checking of candidate, or not candidate, but um, political official statements. That's the end goal. Now they happen to publish articles out of this based on what's the most egregious misstatement or the most, you know, somebody said something and they were totally right, but people are not believing them. And they create stories out of this data, but the, still the final, like the destination really are these fact checking. And he wrote in, the, in an article for Neiman Lab, I'm disappointed in what hasn't been done where we from inside news organizations haven't gone, where we haven't been allowed to go. So Matt and, and the St. Pete Times News Apps crew got a lot of credit and uh, you know, other folks as well for 
PolitiFact, and that's great. But they worked on some other really great projects that maybe they didn't get as much journalism clout for, such as Tampa Bay mugshots. So it really revolutionized how people look at mugshots locally, and that's been replicated pretty much everywhere. Every, every news company now has a mugshot site. And we can sit here all day long and debate the ethical, uh, the, you know, the ethical decisions that go into that type of thing. But if you're living in that area, if you're living in the Bay Area, that is useful information to you. You might see somebody on there that you interact with all the time, and that changes the way that you live. Another thing that they built that is, is really kind of at the crux of what I want to talk about is a thing called Home Team. So Home Team was a prep sports site. And every news site, uh, every newspaper has this in some way. They have a prep sports site where they're trying to gather all this information from all these high schools that's going on. And it's really trying, you're trying to replicate what, what ESPN does in some way. Here's the sports that are going on on Friday night or Tuesday night. Here's the scores as fast as that we can get them. Um, because sports are really important to people. And you know, sometimes from a, from a lofty white tower approach, we think, well, that's not helping them make some political choice. It's not helping them make some financial transaction. You know, is this journalism? Is this really important? Is this how we should be spending our time? But at least in small, in, in small town, or when your context gets really small, this is really important. High school sports are tremendously important to your cultural identity in small town. And it's even like the meeting place where a lot of people get together and that's where they do their socialization. Every single Friday night when I'm at a, when I, I'm at a high school football game, it's like a town hall meeting. Everybody gets together, they're tailgating ahead of time. So it is really, really important for these people. So this is the shot in, in Gainesville. We, it's, it's actually pretty unique that we have a city field. So all the local teams play at the same field. So it's really interesting to see the dynamic of the three different high schools depending on when they come in and, and who they're playing. So the home team usually has a really, really good showing. That would make sense. But the away team, this is a little bit trickier. All right, this is an exaggeration. It's usually more filled than that. But if we're talking about uh, you know, a team that might be an hour away, that is really hard for parent, relative. That's, that's a really hard thing to do. How do I get to this place where I interact with the people in my community, the high school? How do I do that when it's an hour away and I have I have bills I have to pay, I've got clothes to wash, I have all these other things to do. So the project I've been working on uh, with, my, with my brother and a couple other people of Splashbox Sports, we're really trying to take what, we're trying to, should I go back? Ah, should I go back? There we go. We're really trying to fill that side up virtually. We're trying to make it where you can be at the game without having to be at the game. People already do this. This is not anything that's radically new. So ESPN, the master of this. They get ridiculous traffic. Uh, so what, what, are the, what are the things that are preventing you know, everybody being like ESPN? Well, when you're talking sports broadcasts and sports data, the place where you're going to start is something like ES, or you're going to start with uh, professional sports leagues. Because professional sports leagues have the fewest amount of teams, so it's easier to understand who the fans are. It's easier to understand their behavior and kind of target them. Then we move to college, and why do we want to have broadcasting of college and information about college? Well, college sports, you know, and then I guess in the southeast it's a little bit different, but in the southeast it really is a, it's a matter of, of culture. It's a matter of feeling connected to the university that you're a part of. Even people that, my, my wife doesn't like football in the least, but she went to Auburn University, and when it's Saturday and football's going on, I mean, she is going to be on the phone and on Twitter and on Facebook with her friends because it's a common part of their culture that they, connect, they can connect to even though they never see each other uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. High school, I'd say, is even more important for culture. High school sports is really, really significant for culture, but it's very difficult to broadcast this. It's very hard to make the, the economies of scale work. So there's two big parts in this economy of scale that are different between ESPN and say what a, a ind independent broadcaster is trying to do or a, a newspaper. You've got the video equipment, and then you've got the data. So for the video equipment, you know, you, if you're trying to do a live game, you might have a couple hundred thousand dollars for your, your cameras, your mixers, your satellite trucks, all that type of stuff. So how do you do that? How do you make money? Uh, in, in the Bay Area and most other major markets, you're going to have the cable provider do a game of the week. All right, that's great. So I've got a game of the week, and that's more for a football fan. That's not where I want to see my kid play every single game. 
I'm a father that's on, the, on a road trip. I'm, a, I'm an uncle who's in another state, and I want to stay, I want to feel connected to my family so that I can call him up after the game. I can, I can call her up and say, that was a great job in that volleyball match or that soccer match or whatever it might be. So we've got the, the broadcast part, which we can now, and pretty much similar gear to what's going on here for, for streaming, the cost for doing live broadcasting is so ridiculously lower now than it was even a couple years ago. And we had one game that we were doing, and we were doing it at the same time as the University of Florida Division of Multimedia Properties. So for us, we had one person on camera, one person doing a video mixer. We, have, we work with a local radio station, guys, so we've got the play, by, play guy and a color. So we do broadcast on local radio, and we, we simulcast on the web with video. So we had four of us. Now, the UF Division of Multimedia Properties had 12 people and about $100,000 worth of gear. We had four people and about $10,000 worth of gear. Now, if we look at the huge disparity, they can do one game. They, you know, they, they can do one game a season. How many can we do? We can do as many as we want because the cost of trying to get somebody to recoup, recoup the couple thousand dollars for a full season is pretty easy. So what our real goal is not for us to do this. We want to wean this down and make it so simple that we can hand it off. See now, I mean, we're doing off one laptop. It's really simple. We're trying to make it so the schools can do it themselves. And even if they don't have press facilities and it's just a little tiny, you know, little tiny stand, they can rent a little list. They can do it. And trying to make it where it's a one-button video broadcast that basically costs nothing. Um, so far, we've done 53 games. We've got visitors um, in 40 countries and. The real astonishing thing is that the average visit to the site is 27 minutes. Now that's over the life that, the, that, our, that our company has existed. So that counts the people who are there for only five seconds and then leave. But that's the average visit over the life of the site is 27 minutes. And in these countries, we have about 10 where people actually watch full games every single week. Colombia, Norway, Denmark. We've got family members who watch games every single time their team is on. And so we try to do a lot of the same games from the same teams. We're only one company. So what we really want to do is, I don't want to be broad broadcasting games for forever. I'm trying to drive down the cost of the video and also the cost of kind of that data portion of it. What are the scores? Um, how many yards does, did, did my nephew have? Who scored the last play? So, so that's kind of what I work on more is the tech of that real-time data. But trying to put this down in where it's Essentially, every school could do this no problem. They could do one bake sale, and then they could be their own sports broadcaster. Because that's the, the my, my vision would be where every single school could have their own sports broadcasting station and be able to do everything. Because when, you when you've got these problems of, of cost, you can do football games. People can do football games, one football game a week. OK, that's great. You know, and guys get a lot of coverage for that, and they, it helps them get scholarships. That's OK. Now for basketball, there's a couple teams that can do basketball on broadcast, but high school teams, but there's not many. But what do you do about all those other sports that matter just as much to the people? Volleyball, tennis, soccer, it matters just as much to the people, that, to the kids that are doing it and the family that's involved. But no professional broadcasting company is ever going to come in and spend $100,000 to broadcast a tennis match. It's small, there's no way they can recoup the cost, but does that mean it's not important in this very close proximity and in this community that builds around sports. There's one, 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 well, a couple words that always stick in my head when I'm doing this and kind of make it worthwhile since it is a lot of work trying to bring down all this cost and kind of being on, on the right side of the uh, diffusion curve here, but Djibouti. So Djibouti, it's not related to webcam shows. It's not, it's not at all related to that. So Djibouti is a little place on the east side of Africa. Okay, so it's particularly known as there's a, there's a Navy base there. And also this guy who's always in my head, this catcher, Jimmy Jones. So Jimmy Jones, he's at this small um, St. Francis Catholic High School in Gainesville, small place. Really the only time it ever gets press coverage is because the coach and assistant coach are the sons of Roger Maris. So when somebody's on a, on a home, you know, home run chase, they do an obligatory story about St. Francis and try to get the Maris brothers to take on home runs. But, but uh, um, Jimmy Jones here, he started catcher as a freshman. And why does this matter? So he's starting catcher uh, as, a, as a freshman. And Djibouti, his dad is deployed and has never gotten to see him play. So he's been deployed in the Navy the whole time that his son's been playing. 
So we had one specific game. We're in Gainesville. There, there, there's Djibouti way over there. So now let's look at the difference. That's, I, I didn't do two arrows, but we know where Florida is, right? <laughs> so that's a long way. Now in this one game, he's playing catcher, we're doing our video mixing, and then I start to look around in the crowd, and I see somebody on the phone. We start talking. Jimmy, John's, uh, Jimmy Jones' dad and about 10 guys in his unit are watching the game at 2.30 in the morning in Djibouti, and he's on the phone with his wife right then, and they're talking, basically doing play-by-play -play why he's watching on about a 10-second delay in Africa. So he had been deployed the whole time his kid was playing in high school, but he could still use this essentially no-cost live streaming of video to stay engaged with the community so that when he came back, he felt like he was more in place. And so that's Djibouti and Jimmy Jones are the two people that I, or the two things that I keep in my mind a lot of why this type of thing is important and why the future of journalism isn't necessarily making stories or, or videos that appeal to a mass market, but it's building out infrastructure that allow people to, to build their own stories that help, that help them engage with their community. Thanks. <laughs>